Hey, uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, relationships between species, niches, stuff like that. Uh, let's just get going here. Okay, so the term niche. All right, so, uh, and, and by the way, it's not niche, just to be picky. Okay, so a niche is basically the the part of an ecosystem that a given organism is going to occupy, a given species will occupy. It's what resources, you know, food resources does it use? How does it use them? Uh, where does it make its nest or its home? Uh, how does it interact with the other members of its environment? These things collectively make up a niche. So that's kind of a vague thing. So let's just take a look at what we're talking about here. Okay, so let's talk about this. I love these birds. It's called a jacana bird. I've seen these things in Belize. Um, so a jacana bird <clears throat> occupies a rather interesting niche. It lives on lily pads. So it has these very specialized ginormous toes that lets it spread its weight out over the over lily pads so it can walk out there where other organisms can't and it uses its beak to flip the lily pads over and eat things like uh you know small like snails and fish and small crabs things like that uh so so it's basically it's where it's where it lives and what it eats uh, but but the thing is, it doesn't really have much competitors. So that's one of the things that's important about niches. It helped us. It helps us see where different organisms can live. Now, uh, a nearby niche would be occupied by a heron. Now, herons are wading birds. So rather than having these these big broad feet to let them stand on lily pads, this guy couldn't stand on a lily pad. But instead, he wades in the fairly shallow water. And actually, not even that shallow. There's long legs. But if you notice, eats fish exclusively. Now. Uh, so it doesn't put itself in direct competition with the jacana. It doesn't walk out where it walks out. It doesn't eat the same diet that the jacana does. There's a little bit of overlap in terms of their diet, but not in terms of the location. There is an overlap in location between the heron and this beauty here, a spoonbill, a roseate spoonbill. And now if you look at this spoonbill, although it has the same legs and walks in the same water as the heron, uh, this uh, beak is adapted to um, extract small crustaceans and zooplankton, larger zooplankton, copepods and things like that from the shallow waters. By the way, we have spoonbills here in Korea. They're, they're, they're quite cool. If you ever get a chance to go to the coastline, maybe you'll see one. Uh, talk to Miss Surrett. She's the one who showed me one. But anyway, the point is that the spoonbill and the heron, they may occupy the same area, but they, they're, 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 they have different niches because they eat different foods. So they're not in direct competition with each other, which is where I want to go next with this. So there's a thing called, and this is really tested quite a bit in the uh, AP, uh, on the APES test, and that is called the competitive exclusion principle. And the idea is no two organisms can occupy the exact same niche because inevitably, in every case we've looked at, one of the organisms will outcompete the other one. And as a result, uh, they'll, they'll, the one that gets outcompeted just will not be there. It either has to move away or it, it goes extinct. So that you'll only have one particular species occupying a particular niche in a particular uh, biome, I should say habitat. Here's a great example of it here. So let's just take bacteriums, uh, Aurelia and uh, Caudatum, and we're gonna grow them in separate nutrient uh, medium okay so they, they are very similar what they eat and you can see we get similar curves which we'll be studying these type of logistic curves later on in the year but now look at what happens if we mix them together what we find is that the aurelia out competes the caudatum and and the caudatum its numbers go almost to zero the two cannot occupy the exact same niche they they basically they try to, but this one outcompetes that one. This is what we call a competitive exclusion principle. Now there is a workaround, all right? So this is a, a good graphic for helping you see that, that workaround. So basically here we have uh, two test tubes and we've got these, oh, I forget, what are these things called? I love these things too. <laughs> I've seen them in microscopes. Anyway, I forget what they're called. Ah, I almost had to start with a P. But um, uh, basically, they like to eat basically the same kind of food for the most part. So if I mix them together here, what I find is the blue one outcompetes the pink one. And paramecium, I knew it started with a P. The blue paramecium outcompetes the other one. And so uh, that's competitive exclusion. But there is a workaround and it's called resource partitioning. And again, they will definitely talk to you about this or ask questions about this on the APES test. Often we get this vertical stratification. Let's just say in this case that there are certain uh, 
food items that tend to, to occupy the bottom of the test tube, that's where this guy is going to take advantage of it because it's a better food source. This guy is left to eat the ones up above. So they can both occupy the same region, but they partition it up so that one is feeding at a different part of it on a slightly different uh, food source. And we see this quite a bit in nature, this vertical partitioning. Now, resource partitioning can happen in two different ways. It can happen in terms of time or in terms of location. So a great way of thinking about it is, uh, imagine if you were to go to say like Disneyland, you can buy these passes that let you go into a certain ride at a certain time. So that we find that happens uh, in, the, in, in, in nature, that there's a certain uh, time partitioning that happens, usually day versus night or morning versus evening. Uh, or you can have vertical ones. So think about like bunk beds, you know, two people have to share a dorm room, uh, but one's got the lower bunk, one gets the upper bunk. So a good example of a time partitioning would be uh, swallows and bats. Now they're both insectivores, at least the two species that we're looking at here. Uh, they both fly. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, they, they have the same niche, except this one takes the daytime and this one takes the nighttime. That way they're not in direct competition with each other. And vertical partitioning is very, very common. You see it in coral reefs, you see it in forests, you see it in soils, you see it all over the place. Uh, it's very, very common. And so basically the idea is you have different birds and what they'll do is, is they'll, they have very similar eating habits. So they'll, they'll occupy different positions in the tree and over time they will adapt themselves to, to the nuances of their specific vertical locations within this environment. Uh, here's a good graphic of this. So if we look at uh, a, the shorebird situation, they eat fairly similar things, but we have basically here is vertical partitioning, that the flamingos will take the deeper water, the ducks slightly shallower, the avid sets the, in, in very close to shore, the oyster catches right on the shore, and the plovers a little bit in. So you notice they're not all eating the same thing. So, so it's not quite exactly vertical partitioning, but it's the basic idea is they will adapt to occupy certain you know, instead of just saying the shore is the niche, well, it's not quite. Okay, <clears throat> then we have what's called the fundamental versus realized niche. And the idea is that uh, if there was no other competing species out there, you had no competition, then a particular species would occupy a certain niche. But when there are competitors, we often end up getting that, that uh, uh, partitioning, you know, resource partitioning, and as a result, the organism will occupy a smaller area, what we call its realized niche. So here's a great example of it here. We have two different kinds of barnacles here. This one here, I had to look up how you pronounce that. It, it, different people say different things, but usually it's just pronounced thalamus, kind of like your hypothalamus in your brain, okay? So basically, if there were no other, um, uh, what are these things, barnacles around, it would occupy this niche from the lowest low tide to the highest high tide. We just see nothing but this one kind of barnacle. However, it turns out the semibalanus barnacle is just, better at, at, at reaching out and getting the food that the thalamus ones want and so but but it's it's um it doesn't do as well being out of the water for as long so what we find is if we go to places where both of these are present we see a var vertical partitioning so the the uh um there's this is the niche that it could occupy but the realized niche is actually here so its fundamental one cannot really be occupied when the other one is around all right, let's move on to another topic that's about species interactions, but totally different. Okay, when we talk about how, I hope this is probably completely familiar to you from biology. Uh, when species interact with each other, as they do, they we can say like, look, you can have it be a beneficial interaction, which will put a plus sign. It could be a harmful or negative interaction, we'll put a, a negative sign, or it could be neutral. It doesn't really affect one at all, so we put a zero with it. So clearly, in this case here, the cheetah is benefiting from getting food, and the gazelle is uh, is having a bad day, so we're going to give it a negative one. Okay, so let's just look at these different ones. And I, again, I think this will be familiar to you from biology. So these are the six general types of relations we're going to look at. Uh, and let's just get going through them, okay? So let's start with competition. So competition, it's never good. Uh, you know, it's always better not to have competitors. So uh, we put it as negative, negative. So we have like a lion tail macaque and some other kind of monkey. I don't know what it is. They both want to occupy the same part of the tree, but this guy's more aggressive. He's going to take the parts of the tree that are uh, more prolific in providing food. So this guy's going to be forced to take on a, a smaller region of the niche as a result of that. But no matter what, 
if if one of those monkey species was gone, the other one would do better. So competition is always a negative, negative. Now, predation clearly is good for one and not the other one. So predation is is good for the predator and bad for the prey. Uh, clearly, the elk is not too happy about the wolves. Um, but it's worth noting that 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 uh, not that when you have this type of relationship, it's a very special relationship, the predator prey relationship, because the predators not only affect the number of prey, but also the behavior of the prey. And by changing that, we'll see in a, in a future lesson, it, it, it changes the entire environment by changing the behavior and numbers of those prey items. So this predator-prey relationship is a very important one. Herbivory is another important one. Uh, so basically, uh, in, in certain ecosystems, especially grasslands and savannas, you have large numbers of grazing animals, and they have a huge impact on the, on the life that's present. Uh, so it's obviously good for the organism that's doing the eating, the herbivore. It's not so great for the grass and other things that's getting eaten. Although you can make the argument that that uh, it does keep the environment uh, in a certain uh, uh, form that is you know good for grass. You know, without it being present, without the bison being present, there'd be trees and there wouldn't be grass. So you know, this positive negative. I mean, obviously, it's not great to get eaten, but. Uh, without the bison, the grass probably wouldn't be there either. Again, that's for a future lesson. All right. Now, symbiosis is one that everyone likes talking about. I'm sure you study this when you were taking biology. Uh, so basically, you have a, a, a co-evolution that occurs. So you have two organisms that over time have evolved in such a way that they interact with each other in a special way. And again, it can be mutually beneficial, benefit one, not the other one. So there's three types of symbiosis. There's mutualism, parasitism, and commensalism. Let's look at each one of these briefly. Mutualism is beneficial for both. In my mind, this is so, really the more interesting type of symbiosis. This is what most people think of when they think of symbiosis. Uh, so basically we're talking about like flowering plants and pollinators. So, you know, this orchid can't grow if this one hummingbird isn't there to pollinate it. Ants and aphids. So let's, you know, let's just take a look at them in terms of I got some pictures. Okay, so basically there would not be angiosperms if it wasn't for pollinating bees and other insects like that. That one cannot live without the other. They both are totally dependent on each other one. This provides the food and this provides the ability to reproduce. Uh, ants and aphids are fascinating. So, so these ants basically carry these around just like a cowboy drives cows to better pastures. The ant carries the aphids new place. The aphid makes this, this uh, juice basically that the ants live off of. Both of these are completely dependent upon each other. No ants, no aphids, no aphids, no ants. That's kind of the idea of symbiosis, at least in terms of mutualism. Uh, then we have things called oxpeckers, uh, basically birds that are going to eat ticks and, and things off of other animals. So it benefits the animal that's getting rid of the, the infecting organisms, and it gives this guy food. So those are good examples of, of mutualism. Oh, here's another one. Everyone loves Finding Nemo. If you ever go snorkeling uh, in a tropical place, you'll see these clownfish. You love them. The idea is uh, the sea anemone is poisonous and it eats small fish. Uh, the clownfish attract fish towards it, and then the sea anemone eats it. So it provides protection for the sea anemone and food for uh, it provides protection for the clownfish and food for the sea anemone. They both win. Then we have parasitism. Everyone hates parasite, right? And I don't think it needs that much ex explanation. But basically, you have organisms that usually live on and on or in another organism eating part of it or, or, or drinking its blood or, or eat like, you know, worms in, in intestines of an organism, eating its food before it does. Uh, when they got things like vampire bats, so, but basically you've got, you've got organisms that are uh, taking food and blood and other things away from, from its host. And then we've got commensalism. Commensalism is not that common one, but basically one benefits and the other one is unaffected by it. Uh, for instance, a, a classic example this would be a cattle egrets. These birds, they're not helping this guy out at all. Basically, what they do is is they hang out around this animal, in this kid, this like buffalo. And as this buffalo walks through the grass, it stirs up bugs, which these guys then go and eat. So, so they're benefiting because he's getting food from them, but they're not doing anything for him. Another one is like bromeliads and orchids that grow uh, in, in in on trees. They don't hurt the trees, but uh, the trees help them out. And then there's these eyelash mites. I don't know if you know this, but you've got these little mites that live in your eyelashes. They're really Demodix famiculara. And they basically, you don't feel them, but they just, they live out their lives drinking the oils that come out of your, your eyelashes. So you get nothing out of it, but they get to drink your eyelash juice. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, that's got it. Uh, I think it's a long one. Sorry about that. Uh, see you guys soon.